Evening ladies and gents, uh, my name is Simon Brown doing intros for this evening. Uh, we're very chuffed to have Keenan and Glover. He's from Stanlib. He runs their, 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 their property funds there. We're going to be talking listed property. We're looking local. We're also looking offshore because our market obviously is relatively small, but there's a whole globe out there as well. But without that, I'm going to hand over to Keelan. Thank you very much. Oh, good afternoon, or good evening rather. So I've got a lot to talk about, um, so there's no time for opening jokes. Uh, I've got, uh, we'll talk about local property, offshore property. So lots of slides, lots of information, a couple of pictures, charts as well. But you are going to get a copy of uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, if you need probably more detail, you're always welcome to actually contact us or talk to Simon. So we'll start off with the local market. That's the South African listed uh, property sector. It's been an amazing sector, continues to do well. Uh, these are the returns over the last uh, couple of years. So from 2006, uh, it's fairly positive returns actually, apart from 2008, where you had a slight uh, negative capital returns, but the income element is a key thing. So we tend to look at property more from an income perspective. So that's the income that's paid out by property companies, and then the gray bars is the capital uh, growth. So primary focus for property is income, capital growth uh, over time. So it's quite amazing numbers that why this sector has continued to outperform probably annualized returns over the last 10 years of about 17, uh, 18 uh, percent are there about. But whereas if you look at what's happening in the economy, the economy has been slowing down. So the Navy line shows uh, the GDP uh, growth. So over time, you see actually GDP growth going down to about uh, almost 0% uh, levels, whereas the income growth is going the opposite uh, direction, which is quite unusual, because on a normal basis, you tend to have your GDP going up and their income goes up, because the economy is doing well. But South Africa has done completely uh, the opposite. So what are we invested in the local markets before I actually explain why this market has continued to do well in a tough environment? So this is the South African listed property sector exposure on the physical uh, property side. About 55% is, is retail, then followed by offices, and then uh, industrial. So we do have some uh, small exposure. Uh, residential is qu still quite small, but actually uh, still growing at a good pace over the next year to two years. And then we've got other section where you have uh, hotels and uh, different uh, sectors, and also storage as well. Storage is a, quite a new sector in South Africa, and we'll see that uh, grow over time. So offices, we invested offices in industrial, in retail, but whenever you drive around Santon, actually almost everywhere now, there's uh, all these big to let signs, there's so much construction going on, up to a point whereby probably five, ten years ago, you just put it to let sign. And then, but now people are coming up with even, uh, say, 2,000 square meters available, last 500 square meters available. It just shows how desperate the market is. And when people look at uh, all these buildings coming up, you've got uh, the Sassel building, that's uh, Bowman Guildland. It's like almost finished, actually, now, if you drive actually past it. There's lots of movement in the office market. So where they are, actually, in the older offices, that's the old offices where Bowman Guildland was, they move into new ones. So this is going to be vacant, so they're looking for tenants. So same as Sassel as well, they move into a lovely building here, but they've got exposure to Rosbank, they've got uh, Randbeck as well, so that will actually create uh, vacancies. Looks good actually in terms of our uh, pictures, but for us as investors, we find it actually quite uh, challenging. And Growth Point has got uh, the specials as well that you get 100% of your first rental uh, free in terms of allowances uh, to attract uh, uh, tenants. This is a Discovery building. That was a couple of months ago. It's almost covered now. And Discovery is also moving as well from the older offices to the new offices. So that's going to create pressure on the what you call B-grade offices, uh, C-grade offices, whereas your P-grade and A-grade will uh, do well at this uh, stage. But it's tough across the world property uh, sector. We move on to the retail sector. Every year, uh, there's always a new shopping center opening every corner and big shopping centers coming up. Uh, we've had Mall of Africa open uh, earlier this year. It's actually a mainland in uh, Maine that opened about two weeks or so ago. If you look at Pretoria East, uh, it's one of the uh, areas with the most number of shopping centers in South Africa, but there's still more retail uh, uh, coming up. So it's quite a big challenge for the, for the retail sector as well. Competition, new supply yet the economy is, is, is slowing uh, down. But property continues to do uh, well, the listed uh, property sector. But on the other side, the retail sector, you can say that um, it's been boosted by uh, the uh, presence or the emergence of uh, international retailers. 
some names such as uh, Cotton On. Cotton On is one of the, uh, they've been doing very well. They've opened lots of stores across South Africa, very successful retailer. H&M is well doing well. Uh, Waterfront, VNA, they opened one in Devon. Uh, they opened one in, another one in Cape Town in Somerset as well. One of the best actually are trading uh, retailers. We've got Starbucks. They've opened the third store in Pretoria, does well. So if you want a lovely cup of coffee, you have to uh, spend uh, probably about 30 minutes or so in the queue. That's the attraction of all these international retailers. They occupy the space. But the challenge is what happens to some of the local retailers. We've seen the numbers from Mr. Price. So Mr. Price competes with some of these names here, H&M and Cotton On, and their sales have been slowing. So that's uh, the challenge you're looking at in the property uh, space. But yet, the appetite for listed property uh, stocks is quite uh, huge continues to be actually amazing. Uh, 26 billion rand raised so far. So that's new equity. So property companies have got two options when they want, they're looking for acquisitions, uh, buying shopping centers, buildings. You either go to the, uh, uh, to the banks to get debt or you go to the equity market. So these numbers show the equity uh, market. So let's say in 2011, 16 billion was raised uh, through the equity market, plus through rights issues, uh, through book builds and uh, private uh, placement. So far this year, 26 uh, billion rand. Somebody asked me uh, earlier this year, how much are you looking for this? I said maybe 10 billion or so, but now you're looking at about 26 billion. And there's more coming. There's new listings coming up. We've seen uh, Hammerson from the UK list on the JSE last month. And EPP, that's a Polish company. And then GTC as well, a Poland company as well, listing on the JSE. And then we're going to have local names coming up in the next uh, two months or so. Probably the biggest one and one of the most exciting ones will be uh, Liberty uh, Two Degrees. That's uh, basically the Santon City, uh, Eastgate, um, all coming to the market uh, in early uh, December. Uh, at about 10 billion market cap and it's going to grow over time. And then Spear Properties, that's uh, Mike Flex, used to be Spearhead Properties a couple of years ago, is coming back to the market. And this week we've talked about uh, two players looking to come up with uh, student housing funds. It's quite a challenge right now if all the noise going on with actually fees must fall and everything. So we'll see how that goes. But on a long-term basis, there's a huge shortage of accommodation actually in South Africa for students. And we will actually uh, look at that in more uh, detail. So lots of activity in the, in the listed uh, property space. So what has been driving the markets in terms of our performance? As we say, that GDP has been slowing to almost uh, zero. But what's happened to the property companies, they've changed their strategy. In 2009, uh, for example, about 99% uh, of the earnings came from um, local properties. But come 2016, about 63%. So that means about 37% of the earnings are coming from actually outside South Africa. And that's uh, in the rest of Africa, which is quite small, but most of that in Europe, um, in Australia, and actually in the UK. So over that time, so 19, 2009, that's when the economy was actually fairly strong at that time. But these companies have seen that there's more opportunities in the offshore space. That's why South African earnings have come down and then offshore earnings have gone uh, up. So that's diversification where there's better growth opportunities. So let's break this down actually further to see actually where is actually this money uh, sitting. So there's two colors here. We've got the SA listed property index. This is, uh, that's SAPI. That's the top 20 companies on the JSE, local companies. And then we have the universe. The universe is all the property companies listed on the JSE. Let's focus on the SAPI uh, first. So that means 63% of the exposure is in South Africa, and then the rest is actually in this market, Eastern Europe, we've got UK, Australia. But UK is about 31% if you include all the property companies, because we've got Hammerson coming in, we've got Into, there's Capital and Counties. So we've got the biggest exposure to the UK outside uh, South Africa. But the one that's actually exciting, where everyone is going to at this stage, is um, Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is making up almost 16% or 17% of the SA listed property index. So that's uh, Romania, we're talking about Poland, um, we're talking about Serbia, Montenegro as well, uh, Croatia. That's where some of these companies are going to, to find more exciting uh, opportunities. So our sector has changed completely. From where we were in 2009, we were focused on South Africa. Now if you look at all these different uh, currencies from the pound to the Australian dollar, to the US dollar, to the euro as well. So that's one thing to be aware of when you invest in most of the South African property companies. But there's always downsides and upsides as well of going offshore. So I say that uh, you understand the local market better compared to the offshore markets. But what's the upside? 
Uh, as I mentioned, you're getting uh, currency diversification uh, from the US dollar to the euro to the pound. Probably no one wants the pound at this stage given what's happening with the volatility. But you're also getting actually uh, diversification across, not only across regions, across uh, sectors as well. You get some sectors we don't have exposure to in South Africa. And also the fact that in the offshore markets, funding rates are still fairly low. You can find it about 2%, uh, 3%, 4%, and then buy some of these properties at 7 8% to 9% yield. Where South African funding rates are sitting about uh, around about 10%, to get a good asset in South Africa, it yields about 8% or 9%. So it means you can't actually make money in year one. Whereas in the offshore markets, um, year one, day one, you're actually making money because your yield from your property is much higher than your funding rates, given that you've got low interest rates in, uh, in, the, global property, uh, in the global markets. But the downside is that uh, if you look at most of the leases in, uh, in Europe, for example, uh, if there's no inflation, you're not getting rental growth. So there are leases, unlike in South Africa, where you've got inbuilt escalations, in Europe, they're linked to inflation. So right now, there's no inflation in Europe. That means you can get a 10-year lease, your rent can be flat, even there's no inflation. So that's the downside. So for you to make money, you have to keep actually buying those assets at 7% yield and find them at 4% because you're not getting the rental uh, growth. Second point, uh, third point is that actually some of those markets as well, you've seen some companies go into more secondary markets because it's difficult to compete with the, the big US names or UK names. You can't get the best assets or the prime assets. So over time, we tend to prefer to be more in the prime assets, like your A-grade premium assets, rather than actually secondary assets in the capital cities, rather than in being in the second cities or in the smaller cities. And that management experience as well. So you need to be close to some of those markets. What some of these companies have done, they've partnered with the local players. Some they've gone on their own, but we prefer companies to partner with, uh, with local players. And then you've got issues like Brexit, which is probably difficult uh, to control. But what are the benefits of, of all these listings coming up? You've seen actually huge growth in our listed uh, property sector. So the market cap, so market capitalization run about 770 uh, billion um, rand. I remember when I started about 2003, 2004, the market cap was less than 20 billion rand at that time. So it's grown from that point all the way to almost 800 uh, billion rand. So who's the biggest company right now on the JSE in the property space? Those are the share codes we use, it's Hammerson. It's about 80, 82 billion rand at the time, followed by Growth Point and then Into. So Growth Point is now actually bigger than Into Properties, which is part of uh, the Liberty International, which is split into Into and uh, Capital and Counties. So what you find is that there's a huge gap in terms of market uh, caps. So there's big companies, then very small ones. So you're talking about 30 billion market cap, going forward to about 80 billion, and they've got so many small companies sitting at the 15 billion rand uh, market caps. So it's quite a huge sector, very diverse, from a two, three billion market cap to as much as 82 uh, billion um, rand uh, market cap. So you have to actually find the best opportunities in all these different uh, markets. Sovereign companies have grown, uh, they've become bigger in the, in the global space, and you're finding that uh, the shareholding actually from foreign has actually gone up. Let's pick, let's say, um, Redefine, for example. So in 2007, that was the shareholding from uh, foreigners, probably about one, one and a half percent there about, and that shareholding has gone up to almost a 20 uh, percent. Same applies to growth point at about 17, 18 percent, resilient about 15 percent foreign shareholding, and then high prop almost 30 percent actually foreigners holding high prop. But one thing to highlight is that most of these shareholders are actually basically index uh, trackers. Because South African companies grow, they become bigger, they get included in all these global indices that attracts our uh, index uh, trackers. So it's good for liquidity, it's good for diversification, but it's mainly index uh, trackers. Most actually uh, analysts across the world see South Africa as being expensive because your yields are actually lower than your 10 year bond yield. And the market is trading above uh, the net asset uh, values. So the sector has changed, as I mentioned. So long before, you used to see actually the correlation to the bond market. That means the relationship with the bond market was like 70%, 80%. So over 10 years, the correlation is 0.69, which is about 69% relationship to the bond market. But that correlation has gone down to about 55%, so property versus bonds. So wh why is that? You're finding that because of that offshore diversification. So when bond yields uh, strengthen, they are driven by, by strong rent. When the rent becomes stronger, if you've got 37, 38% of your earnings actually in the offshore markets, that means it's going to dilute your earnings in the, in the local uh, space. So, so I find the markets don't really chase uh, stro uh, stronger bond yields anymore because of the currency element. So the sector has actually changed actually going forward. 
So currency plays a major role right now in the listed uh, property uh, space. So you can see this here. If you look at the last two to three years, uh, the best performing counters were the companies with uh, offshore exposure because the rent weakened. But this year we see the rent strengthen, well, apart from the recent weakness, and the companies with more offshore expo local exposure have outperformed. So they're all the companies play more in the local space. I uh, can see their returns positive, and then the companies in the offshore markets, that's a mess in the UK capital and regional. These are basically UK companies, they've all underperformed. Because the rent is trending against the pound, and the fact that you've had Brexit as well. So currency plays a major role. And you've seen that as well in terms of the uh, third quarter, uh, property local companies outperforming the gray ones with offshore exposure underperforming as well so take that actually in mind that uh, currency is actually a big uh, factor here we look at the valuations so look at south african property versus uh, offshore property on the jse so on a price to book which is basically uh, your share price versus your book value or your net asset value or the value of your physical assets the local property market is trading more in line with book value, so one times book, so same levels as uh, your net asset value or book value. Whereas offshore counters, some of them are trading as much as like 45 to 50% premium above actually the net asset values. So which means uh, you need to get high growth to justify that premium, or the market may be actually overpaying for some of the offshore companies. Because the fact that everyone wants to take their money offshore, they end up actually buying anything that's got actually offshore assets. So it's important to look at the valuations and uh, buy the right um, assets. So offshore property versus local property on the JSE, you find that South African property is looking a bit more attractive at this stage compared to some of uh, the uh, offshore companies. So what you do as well, I've got lots of spreadsheets to stand up, so it's probably more detailed, but I'll try to uh, simplify it. So I've got the vertical axis showing uh, the earnings growth. So it means the dividend growth you're getting uh, from uh, these property companies over the next uh, three years. And then the horizontal axis shows a dividend yield. So but there's so many companies, you've got about, about 45 companies to choose from. So almost, you're getting zero dividend yields. These companies don't pay out any dividends, they're developers, to as much as almost 14% yields within one sector, that's the property sector. 0% yield to as much as 14. And then earnings growth from about uh, nothing to as much as 25%. So look at the yield. So all the property companies on the JSE, they're trading about 6.1% forward yield. That's the yield you're getting. And then on the SA listed property index, the top 20 companies, they give a yield of about 6.6%. And then what we do, we try to strip out some of the offshore companies and see how much yield you're getting. You're getting about 7.5% yield. So offshore companies trade at a lower yield than the lo local companies, so the yield is higher. And then you compare that to the 10-year bond yield, at about, at the time, it was about 8.5%. Uh, so there's actually different valuations now. That's how we look at the market differently. And then look at the valuations. Is the sector looking uh, cheap or expensive? So if you look at that kind of relationship, which changed over time, is that at these levels, you may see actually local property looking a bit expensive on, on this measure. Let's say if you divide your property yield by your bond yield. So the long-term average about 0.84 there about, it's in about 0.6, so looking expensive, because the market is actually factored in offshore earnings. So we try to strip out some of uh, the offshore actually history, which is not there in the, in, the, in, the, in the earnings, and then we get to these kind of total returns. So the range, depending on where the bond yields are, can be anywhere between over the next year, uh, minus 0.1% to as much as 10% total returns. So it's more of a, like a scenario analysis. We're looking at about that range of about uh, flat to as much as 10% total returns. So it depends on the time you get in. But what's more important is that four years. So this is actually one year, this is four years. Over four years, we're saying property will deliver higher single digit returns. As I mentioned earlier, that property has delivered 17, 18, 20% total returns. We don't see that going forward to saying higher single digit uh, total uh, returns in the property uh, space. But the critical thing is that you've got different scenarios. So some of that, you may not predict the bond market right, but what you can predict with more accuracy is your income growth. Because if at least it's signed for three to four years, escalating at seven to 8%, and then it's all about uh, the vacancies, how much gets renewed over time. So over the next year, we're looking at income growth of about 8%. Uh, percent. And then over four years, average annualized income growth of about 7%. Which is a fairly decent number in this environment, where you've actually factored in the rent uh, weakness and also the fact that these companies have done actually very well. 
Whereas in the good times, your distribution growth was above 10%, uh, 12%. So why is there a reduction? Is that there's so much competition in the, in the retail space. Uh, that means if you've got so many shopping centers coming up, uh, you won't get actually that huge rental growth that you used to see before, because all the retailers are competing. And in the office space, there's so many developments coming up as well, and the economy is actually uh, weak. So you're go basically going to get escalations. We are seeing actually negative rental growth in the office market, S slow single digit returns in the retail space and industrial market actually are holding uh, up. But we've seen over time that adding listed property in your portfolio has helped to boost uh, returns. Uh, look, at, look at this chart over 15 years. Uh, the initial portfolio without property is 60% uh, equities, 30% bonds, and 10% cash. So it means if you don't have property at all, over 15 years, you would have achieved about 13.7% annualized total returns. If you add 5%, 14.1, another 5, 14.6, another 5, 15%. And this applies across most periods, three years, five years, 10 years, and 15 years. And over the last year, because of all the volatility, just been fairly pretty flat, slightly negative by adding our property. But for us, one is too short term. We tend to look at uh, a horizon about five years to as much as uh, 10 years when you invest. So when you invest, don't look at one month or three months or six months. Our investment horizon in Stanley is actually uh, officially three to uh, five years, if not uh, longer. And that's the benefits of listed uh, property. And we've done this, uh, it's more like a smarty box, lots of colors here. You look uh, at this at a spare time. Uh, what you've uh, done here is that you've discovered that property has outperformed all other asset classes over the last uh, um, uh, 10 out of uh, 16 years. So it can underperform, outperform, but over time it tends to outperform um, other asset classes. Why is that? It's because you, you've got uh, leases actually escalating at seven to eight uh, uh, percent. So that's the biggest actually driver. And you can predict the earnings with more accuracy. Compared to this, if you invest in a retailer, for example, if the sales go down in the next six months, uh, your dividend actually falls because their, their income is actually down. But they still have to pay the rent. So as a landlord, I'm still collecting the rent from that. And I'm getting that 7 8% escalation. That's why property is more defensive over time because of those uh, long uh, leases. And personally, I expect after this trend to continue over time where property tends to outperform uh, other asset classes, mainly because of what I highlighted earlier on, the income element. That's the critical thing, actually, when you talk about uh, listed uh, property. Focus on income, capital growth over time. And we've done a couple of scenarios as well here to break down the different, actually, sectors in the property space. So look at the universe. That means all the property companies on the JSE. Average distribution growth is saying about 8 to 9 percent over the next year, and then over the next two years, 7 percent, and then compound average over the next three years, about 7 percent. So you're looking at earnings growth or dividend growth of anywhere between 7 to as much as 11 percent depending on which companies you choose. So if you focus on income, you want income growth, property can achieve anywhere between 7 and 10% uh, uh, distribution growth. Apart from developers, because development companies don't pay out the dividends. They use that extra cash or rental income they collect to actually build more actually um, shopping centers or offices. So companies like uh, Attack, which own a Mall of Africa, and Pivotal, the, who own uh, this uh, new building coming up uh, for Bob and uh, Gilfeland. So they use those actually uh, profits to actually build more properties. Those are development companies. They tend to be more of a capital play rather than an income uh, play. So to sum up this slide, income growth anywhere between actually seven uh, to as much as 11%, depending on which companies you choose over the next uh, three uh, years. So to conclude on the local property market, it's quite a mixed uh, picture. There is a bit of upside and then downside as well. On the upside, big shopping centers, they can't actually accommodate all the tenants. They're still a waiting list for most of these big shopping centers. H&M is looking to open more stores. Uh, they can't get space in some of those big shopping centers. So that's why it's nice to actually be in there, nicely positioned to have big dominant shopping centers where every retailer wants to be in. And then increase offshore exposure. In an economy where actually GDP growth is flat or might be negative, you've got diversification in terms of uh, regions, uh, Europe, we've got Australia, or even UK if you select the right uh, companies at these uh, levels, because UK has been severely uh, punished because of uh, Brexit. And then corporate action. As we mentioned, there's more than 45 companies in the local space, different kinds of yields from 2%, 1% to as much as 14%. So that could actually create actually uh, opportunities where companies merge. 
and we've seen Regifan announce uh, that they're going to actually merge with uh, Pivotal. And there's only two or three other smaller companies which could be uh, takeover targets. And that tends to boost uh, the share prices. So we'll see more of that uh, in the next uh, 12 uh, to uh, 14 months. On the downside is rising bond yields. When the rent weakens, as we saw over the last two days, you see bond yields uh, going up and that actually affects uh, the property market. So that creates that volatility in the property market. Brexit, we are affected by Brexit in South Africa because we've got so many companies with exposure to, uh, to the UK at this uh, stage. Office vacancies is a big headache. Ask any CEO of a property company, office market is just tough. Uh, they're just doing it as much as they can to get tenants and give them incentives and allowances to actually attract uh, tenants. Retail sector, if you're in the right space, yes. But uh, we're seeing actually some uh, tenants actually uh, closing down, some shops are not doing well. We've seen Edgar's closing down some of the smaller stores and moving into more bigger shopping centers, dominant shopping centers. Operating costs still actually uh, concern. Uh, rates and taxes continue to go up way above actually uh, inflation or income growth. And that's another challenge in the property space. And we've talked about um, economic uh, growth. So to sum up the listed property sector, at this stage, you're saying probably lower total returns, focus on income. Income is going to be critical uh, going uh, forward. Then I'll move on to, to the offshore markets. We're going to talk more about the UK and then the US. And we try to travel across uh, the world in different markets. Offshore markets have been interesting uh, year to date. And we like to actually travel across uh, the world to understand what we're investing. We run the uh, Stanley Global Property Fund. It's about a six billion uh, rand fund. And our model at Stanley is to never invest in any market without actually visiting the, the, the markets, uh, walking through some of those buildings, uh, talking to management, attend conferences. So just give you an example, these are the trips we have uh, lined up of we've done this year from Japan to Philippines. Uh, next week we're going to, to Australia, spending a week there to see what's happening in Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, and, uh, and, and Canberra. So that's our model. We're always on the ground. We're fundamental uh, players. So what's happening in the offshore markets is that property has been outperforming equities across most markets apart from uh, the US recently with uh, the potential rate hike. And then UK, it's uh, quite obvious, it's uh, Brexit. So the UK market is actually down 26% year to date. So it's falling 26% year to date. So there's two colors here. So 26% down, the brown line shows the return relative to equities. So if it's negative, it means properties underperformed equities. So in the UK, properties underperformed equities by 25%. So why is that? If you look at most UK companies, they tend to focus more on the UK. So from into only recently, they're moving to Spain, but all the UK companies are, be, are focused on the UK. So that means with all the Brexit happening or this consensus around Brexit, they get affected, they get sold off. Whereas equities in the UK, like look at the FTSE 100, most of the earnings are actually outside uh, the UK. That's why properties underperformed equities. And it's simple that because uh, property, you've got assets in the UK, whereas uh, FTSE 100 companies can move operations to other areas. But if you're a property company with all the assets in the UK, you can't carry those buildings from the UK and take them to Dublin or Paris or, or Frankfurt. So that's the challenge right now with, uh, with the UK. US is slightly underperformed year to date. Equities is up about uh, 5% in dollars, but then concerns around potential rate hikes actually coming through in the, in the US. The best performing market is Hong Kong. Hong Kong actually is coming off a low base where uh, last year it underperformed, mainly because of rents actually slowing down or negative rental growth in the office space, in the retail uh, space as well. Because Hong Kong is linked to China. Over 30% of their retail sales actually come from mainland China. As China slows down, it affects actually the Hong Kong uh, property uh, market. And you've seen that actually reflect last year, but now actually all that is priced in, you're seeing the market actually coming back. And the other point is that the Hong Kong dollar is linked to the US dollar. As the dollar strengthens, they actually benefit uh, from that. Australia has also been doing uh, well, it's outperformed quite strongly against uh, the equity uh, market. But the world is up about 6% uh, year to date and then are slightly underperforming equities by less than a uh, percent, just performing fairly in line with uh, equities. So let's talk about the UK. The UK has been uh, very topical over the last couple of months. So let's compare UK to uh, Europe. So Europe uh, slightly up, that's this brownish line, and then UK is actually down, as I, as I mentioned. And two days after the uh, outcome of the referendum, it was down 15% in one day. And then following day, another 10%, uh, 12%. So that creates actually buying opportunities for some of our portfolios. 
because we looked at the leases on average in the sector, they've got about almost six years until the, uh, the first break, lease break period. So that means you've got your income still actually fairly secure. So the biggest challenge is what happens if some of those corporates actually move uh, to Dublin or Frankfurt to Paris, but you've got about six years to go in terms of most actually leases. So from an income perspective, we're still fairly comfortable. But the concerns around capital volatility, we see this market underperform uh, Europe by almost 30% uh, actually over the last uh, year. So that's the concern. And you dig deeper as well into some of the companies on the JSE. So I know many people are invested in capital in counties, they're invested in uh, Intu, uh, the former Liberty International, and they've got the new entrant, which is Hammerson. Hammerson is done better than uh, Intu and capital in counties. Uh, why is that? Uh, about 60% of the assets, they are in the UK, and then 40% outside the UK. So they put assets in Dublin, uh, they're in uh, Netherlands, they're looking in France as well. They've got nice, actually, shopping centers, retail outlets. Whereas the West performer has been capital in counties, down 40% since the, um, uh, the outcome of the referendum. So the challenge of capital in counties is that they've got good assets, uh, which is Covent Gardens, but then the residential portfolios, that's where the headache is. You've seen actually pre-sales uh, recently down about 14% in the UK, and then some transaction volumes year on year, some of them down as much as 70, 80%. So the residential space is one to avoid um, probably at this stage, but we believe with capital encounters at these levels actually priced in. Some of the analysts think that uh, the market is priced in about 60% downward revision in the residential property values. They did reduce residential by 14% at the last result, and the market thinks there's another 60% if you look at the, uh, how the share price underperformed. So into, at this stage, uh, as I mentioned, they've diversified into uh, Spain. They're buying more assets in Spain. They do have into Lexa that's in the, in the UK, and then Spain's actually a great market. Spain right now, actually, everyone's actually moving to Spain. They like the retail sector there. Uh, tourism is good. Uh, they're saying this year, Spain was going to have the best, actually, number of uh, tourist arrivals. What's driving Spain is that uh, people are going less to Turkey, they're going less to France in terms of tourists, and this helps some of these uh, shopping centers in the right uh, space. So from a tourism basi basis, it helps this market, boosts services market, boosts actually office market there as well. So Spain's actually uh, the, the flavor of actually uh, the day at this stage, or this year. We've seen so many corporates move into uh, Spain. I talked about capital and counties. Um, they've got two assets basically. That's uh, Covent Gardens, a uh, brilliant asset, trades very well, it's always busy. I looked at it when it was underground. It's the only actually station where they tell you where's Covent Gardens here. But this, it's so busy, weekends and evenings, that please just stop on the next uh, station or the one before. So shopping centers are all about people. And as people spend at any given point in time, there's lots of people. With the pound weakening 10, 15% against the dollar, more tourists as well going to the UK. And these actually uh, benefit Covent Gardens. But the biggest challenge is this. When they're in June, they're still digging it up here to build more apartments. And they've had reduced values by 14%, and there's potential more declines. And not only just capital and counties, you've seen other developers as well. Actually, it's been tough to sell apartments. You're getting finish allowances. They give you stamp duty allowance as well, and can win even a free parking bay in the UK to buy an apartment. And parking is so expensive in the UK. Now you're getting all those uh, incentives coming up. And all the developers can even offer you like uh, a drive around uh, the city in a, in a Lamborghini or in a Ferrari just to attract uh, people. That's how competitive this market is. So capital encounters, we believe most of the bad news is priced in, given that the shares price underperformed uh, very uh, much uh, this year. So what do we have exposure across uh, the world? Uh, the world, uh, if you look at our portfolio, uh, we've got about 60% uh, 60 exposure to North America. That's USA and Canada, which is basically US. Japan about 8%, UK 8%. So we overweight the UK by about 3% because we think actually there's some opportunities in the UK. And then we've got Europe about 11%. Out of our 11% European exposure, 5% is in Germany. So we've got exposure to German uh, residential. And we like uh, Germany at this stage and we've been buying more properties or getting more exposure to uh, Spain at this uh, stage. And cash, we keep cash quite small. 2 to 3 percent for liquidity purposes, not uh, to time uh, the market. So when, when people invest in our fund, they're getting full property exposure. So you don't when the market goes up 20 percent, for example, then somebody's sitting with 50 percent cash. So we don't time the market using cash. We we'll like to be uh, stock uh, pickers. And what are our top 10 holdings? Uh, most of our holdings are actually in the U.S. Our U.S. is the strongest market in the world right now. So 9 out of 10 in the U.S. I'll talk about a few. Simon Property Group. 
They own about 100 malls across uh, the U.S., uh, big, dominant company, very huge, with a market cap of, uh, I said South Africa's got a 770 billion market cap. Simon Property Group has got uh, almost uh, a trillion rand market cap. So this company alone uh, is bigger than the world South African listed property sector combined with malls across uh, uh, the world. They've got public storage, the self-storage, that's a very big actual sector in the U.S. Compared to South Africa, slowly coming up here, because what you find in the U.S., people are moving more into the CBDs. They want to be more central. And if you're more central, you live in a smaller space. If you've got a smaller space, you've got access uh, things. Then you have to use the storage uh, facilities. And if we have Prologis, that's uh, e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce, industrial sector. Internet shopping as well. That's a big driver for industrial sector at this uh, stage. The only company that's not actually in the U.S., in our top 10 holdings, it's Unibal Rodemco. We love this company. They own the biggest and the best uh, shopping centers across Europe. So in almost every capital city in Western Europe, they've got uh, the biggest shopping center and the best shopping center, and the second biggest cities as well, and in some instances, third uh, biggest uh, city. So it's all about quality, it's all about uh, dominance. I'll show you some pictures uh, later on. And they've got some offices here. This is actually basically New York, Manhattan. If you see Manhattan skyline, most of these companies here, here they own uh, the buildings that you see here there from Times Square, and those are big dominant uh, uh, properties. And then we've got residential as well. It's quite a big sector in the US. Uh, for this uh, global property sector, it's about 12, 13%, where South Africa is about two to three uh, percent. So residential has got some of the lowest uh, vacancies in the US. Moving back to London. So why we liked London uh, last year and uh, early this year was because of this chart. This is actually, it's an amazing chart. If you look at across uh, the world of London, vacancies sitting at about 2%, 3%. Where is South Africa? About 11, 12% are vacancies. So London, 2%. And one thing about London is that uh, there's planning restrictions. Uh, there's site restrictions. You can't just build a tall building and then uh, block uh, the views as well. So it takes time to rezone uh, land. And so you, so you can't go up in London, you can't go out. So there's restrictions. That's why you find there's low vacancies. So fundamentally, look at that, it's been actually a very strong actually, uh, sector in the office market. And we're seeing rents growing, going up about 10%, 12% in the last year, two years, or two, three years. But that's changed. So you've got all these Londons here, just, let me just break it down. So you've got um, London, and then uh, central London, which is the innermost part of London, and then you've got the city of London. So city of London is actually inside central London, where you find uh, the uh, banking institutions, insurance companies, that's the sector that's most volatile at this stage, if you think of banks actually moving out of uh, the UK. Then we've got West End. West End is basically Covent Gardens, it's uh, Mayfair, so actually different Soho, Chinatown, uh, those areas as well. That's going to be much stronger going forward compared to the city, which is banks and insurance companies. And it shows in terms of uh, rental focus coming from different companies. So West End is going to be probably slight decline in 2017 and then goes up about 2.8% to 2% rental growth. So that's West End, tourism, uh, different sectors, not just offices or banks. Whereas uh, the city, which is basically banks, rents could fall as much as 16%. Some people talk about even 20% uh, rental uh, declines in the city. So how you position yourself, focus more on West End London rather than the city of, uh, of, of London at this stage. So that's London. So move on to other exciting markets. Uh, Paris, uh, we do have exposure to these, uh, all these buildings. Uh, Paris, for the last five years, there was no rental uh, growth at all. And that market's actually uh, changed, turned around now, and we're seeing demand coming through, and we're seeing rental growth in Paris. So this company I uh, mentioned earlier on, it's by Rodemco. They own mostly shopping centers, but when they build offices, they build these kind of uh, offices in a large defense. And looking at the rental growth uh, focus, as I mentioned, Paris, no growth for the last uh, five years, but the focus in Paris, they show about 5% rental growth uh, in 2016, 3%, uh, which is as much as 8% rental growth. So it's okay. But Spain, in a different uh, league altogether, you're looking at rental growth, this year for 13%, another 13%, and as much as actually 8% over three, uh, three years. So it's a very strong market uh, right now, uh, uh, Spain. So apart from London, you can look at other opportunities in Europe. So not only offices, you can move to residential. That's German residential. So Germany is uh, actually facing shortage of accommodation at this stage. And first of all, the Germans don't believe in buying actually property, they rent. So that means you've got pressure from the Germans. And then last year, there were 1.1 million people that moved to Germany last year. 
And this year, predictions show up to as much as 1.5 million people moving to Germany. Germany is operating almost full employment, and you've got refugees as well coming in. And refugees do actually occupy some of uh, these. Uh, these are three biggest companies in, in Germany. So some of them get accommodated as well. You get a check either from the city council. They actually sign big blocks of apartments. Or once they get their paperwork sorted out, they can actually sign leases on an individual basis. So it creates that huge demand. So in Germany right now, there's no, actually, uh, there's no inflation. But you're seeing actually rental growth of anywhere between 3 to 4% for the overall portfolios. But for some of the leases coming up, uh, they're seeing as much as 15 to 20% rental growth you're seeing because of shortage of accommodation and huge demand for accommodation. And to rezone space takes as much as uh, three years. To build something new in Germany right now will cost you almost 100% or more because land has gone up and there's actually a shortage as well. So that's one sector we like at this stage, German residential. So talk about Europe, about UK, let's move on to, to the US, which is the biggest market uh, in the world. So vacancies across the U.S. are actually falling. We're seeing actually a decline in office vacancies, uh, decline in these apartments. As I mentioned, like apartments, vacancies fall 4 4.5%, less than 5%, almost fully late, basically, apartments. And then industrial sector, declining vacancies, uh, retail declining as well. So the trend in general in the U.S. is seeing uh, declining vacancies. So when vacancies decline, rents actually go up. So there's actually positive rental growth in the U.S., about 3% on average uh, rental uh, growth. Remember, it might not sound a high number, but those markets have got lower inflation as well. So 3% is actually decent actually rental growth. If you find across all the markets, industrial, retail, residential, and offices in the U.S. So when rents go up, they tend to attract, uh, attract actually more uh, developers or people start building more stuff. So you're seeing actually supply picking up, but it's not big actually, this supply. We're talking about 1% to 2%, about 1% in general, of actually existing uh, space. Whereas, let's look at the office market in South Africa. Supply is about almost 6% of existing uh, office uh, space in South Africa. So globally, about 1% to less than 0.5%. Spain, 0.45%. France, about 0.5%. So that means there's not much coming up in terms of supply. Why is that? I guess, one, you can say the economic growth is lower, but banks are actually more cautious. Whereas in the good times, you could get a loan, build anything on spec, but now you can't. So there's actually a restriction in terms of funding. So we don't see huge supply actually coming up across the world in general. So that means actually there's going to be more demand actually of existing space. Uh, there's less completions. Let's look at this chart. Uh, let's maybe focus on 2015. Probably about 170 million square feet in terms of um, absorption, which is demand in the US. Whereas completions, about 120 million square feet. So we've got 120 million square feet coming into the market, then demand of 170 million square feet. So that means 50 million square feet, they will have to take up space in existing buildings, which means vacancy is going to decline actually over time. And those are the expectations in 2016, 2017, 2018, demand exceeding supply. There's not much supply actually coming through. There's not much building actually coming through. So we've talked about the US, let's move on to e-commerce, which is actually a big thing. It's a big theme right now across the world. If you go to any conference uh, anywhere in the world, people ask you about e-commerce. What's the impact of e-commerce on shopping centers? Are shopping centers going to die? What's going to happen? But these numbers are a bit scary if you look at it as well from that perspective. So you can invest in industrial, in logistics, and you benefit from this growth. Asia Pacific, you're going to see probably the most growth in terms of uh, e-commerce, almost 80% uh, growth in terms of sales. Whereas Western Europe is actually much more advanced, talking about 25 to 30% in the US, and the world on average about 60% growth over the next uh, two years or so. So who benefits from that is all the logistics companies who've got warehousing, uh, distribution. And then what's the problem with shopping centers now? So I say, no, but don't worry actually, because you can shop online, but you actually can't eat out on the internet. So you have to go out and uh, meet your friends. And then also finding shopping centers are changing concepts. You're seeing actually more food, uh, beverage, and entertainment. So long back, you just like 5 10% of your shopping center. But nowadays, you're talking about uh, as much as 25% up to 30% of uh, food, beverage, and entertainment in shopping centers. So the concepts change as well. And uh, you used to have like a normal food court with uh, more like steers, KFC, but that's changing. People like to enjoy food, they want to be out there as well. You see all these different concepts. 
So simple things like your frozen custard. This is actually Shake Shake in the US. I took this picture about four weeks ago. People actually queue outside to test this frozen custard. Beggars, you've got Rocco Mamas. You talk about your local example as well. People trying all those things. Those are the new concepts coming up. This is Italy Cafe in, uh, in, in the US as well. More like an Italian village as well. So like my theater of food and uh, shopping and then people just being out. So that's a new concept actually coming up. It's going to change actually shopping centers and entertainment is going to be more critical going forward. That's Mall of Scandinavia. We invest in this company. Uh, brilliant shopping center opened actually late uh, last year in Sweden, 100,000 square meters. And they built amazing shopping centers like, to draw people inside as well. Like this fountain as well. We've got this one that goes up like this, down. It's one of the most uh, popular pictures in Sweden on uh, Facebook as well. People want to go out and take pictures. So you have to spend more money to create actually this kind of feel when you go into a shopping center. And it's so clever that, because uh, they know that everyone's got their smartphones here. You want to charge your phone and uh, they create charging points every, what, 100 meters or so. It's, and it's a lovely place to sit, more comfortable. Uh, you feel like in a park or in a forest, charging your phone next to that. And since they've seen that actually, uh, the amount of time that people spend in a shopping center is determined by the battery life of their cell phones. So your cell phone goes off, you want to go out. But they make sure that you stay in the shopping center, you can charge your phone here, so you don't have to rush back home. And then you've got Wi-Fi, and you've got free Wi-Fi as well, so it's, which is fast, it's not 100 megabytes, we just download one song and then it's finished. So you can actually even stay longer. But you can't be downloading your apps all day, you're going to buy a coffee, you're going to buy something, you're going to walk around, and you're buying you know, that. So they've created that element in that shopping center. It's a fantastic shopping center, amazing shopping center. And I mentioned that uh, with uh, online shopping, you see actually more competition. So what you're seeing now, you're seeing stores close down, some of them. Give you an example, Gap is closing about 175 stores across the world. Uh, Macy's, the biggest de department store in the US, they're closing down about 100 stores. So 100 stores in the US is about 15% uh, of the total number of stores that they're closing down in the next six months to a year. So what's happening now is that uh, you find like Zara in 2010, They'll close on some smaller stores, but then they build bigger ones. So 2015, the average store size is 2,400 square meters, whereas 2010 was 1,500 square meters. So somebody suffers, somebody benefits. Same as H&M, 2,300 square meters in 2010, now you're looking about 3,200 square meters. So it's all about dominance. You have to have the best shopping center, the biggest shopping center to draw people there. So we can shop online, but still have a display store. You have to go into the nice uh, flagship shopping center. So what Unibuy has done as well, which is uh, one of our favorite companies, uh, they've created this app as well. Log on to their shopping center, they got this app. It's called, you get a smart map, which gives you directions. You want to go to, let's say, True or Mr. Price. You tap that app, it gives you directions to that store. And then smart park as well. We always complain about parking, but you can find parking, drive 10 times around the shopping center. They've got this app as well here. You just tell that, that app that I'm going to Woolworths. It will tell you which is the nearest parking, the most efficient parking to get to Woolworths. There's no point driving around as well, to so make life simple. And then, uh, if your friends are logged in or kids are logged in as well, they've got this app called Meet My Friends. So the moment you walk into the shopping center, you log in there, you can tell who are your friends who are in the shopping center and gives you directions to your friends as well. And then it's nice with your kids as well, that you know where your kids are at any given point in time. Look at that app. You can track them down actually uh, easily. So they come up with all the simple concepts as well to make it more fun, more interesting to be in a shopping center. And I've actually tried this app as well. It does actually really uh, work. We we'll move on to back to the US. Uh, I've got this company called Vernado. They've got um, buildings around Times Square and they've got amazing screens as well. All these screens actually create revenue. That's a rental income. That's millions of dollars that you find. And we mentioned that Gap closing down about 175 stores. But if you're in the right location, in 2017, they opened a huge store actually in Times Square. So the location is actually critical actually uh, going uh, forward. Westfield uh, is a company, it's an Australian company. That's got artists across the world. They own Westfield London uh, in the UK and Westfield uh, Stratford. And now they've opened uh, Westfield World uh, Trade Center. So this shopping center is right below the, uh, where the Twin Towers, that's World Trade Center. And then uh, you see that concept I mentioned. It's shop, so sh shopping is all about shopping. But it's now eat, drink, and play, which is food, beverage, and entertainment. And they've got all these names actually coming up. As I mentioned that you've got to differentiate yourself, come up with something interesting to draw people. Like this is uh, the, uh, the exterior of the shopping center. It looks amazing. And I've seen lots of people taking selfies outside, lovely pictures. If you're going to take a selfie outside, you want to go in as well. Once you go in, you end up buying a, uh, coffee and other things as well, lots of stores. So that's why you're going to see uh, amazing designs that bring in people to the shopping uh, centers. So across the world, to sum up our rental growth, we're seeing actually positive uh, rental uh, growth, apart from Asia. 
Asia is the one that you've seen actually our rents actually slow down, as I mentioned, with Hong Kong, because uh, of slowdown in China, and then pretty flat rental growth. But generally in Europe, which is this line here, positive rental growth, Asia, so that's, that's Americas, that's the US, and Canada, rental growth as well, and then global rental growth. So when we talk about property, all we look at is rental growth. Are the rents actually going up? And are the vacancies declining? But rents go up because vacancies are declining, there's limited supply, and they're seeing that trend actually coming up across uh, the world. By the end of the day, uh, property earnings, they have to track uh, GDP uh, growth. So there's a strong relationship, a positive relationship, between uh, GDP growth, which is the brown line, and earnings growth from property companies. So you have to watch out for that. If the economy slow down for a long period, that will affect our earnings growth. And you've seen earnings slow down over time because the GDP has slowed down across uh, the world. But still fairly positive. That's the most actually uh, critical thing. And going forward, as I mentioned, there is a limited uh, supply. So that's earnings growth versus GDP growth. How are the property companies valued uh, versus a physical property? It's a very critical thing because all of us always want to, apart from your own apartment, your residential place, you want to have uh, more apartments, you want to rent out uh, that. But the biggest challenge is liquidity. You've got liquidity, you've got uh, concentration risk, that's one tenant. You've got location as well, our currency as well. Whereas listed property offers you actually diversification across different markets and very liquid. Probably just to give you an example, our fund, uh, as I mentioned, about 6 billion rand. Let's say, assume let's say, all the investors want their money back. They can get back their money in less than three days. So it takes us uh, less than three days to sell six billion rand. Uh, I mentioned Simon Property Group, which has got a market cap of almost a trillion rand. Our shareholding there is 0.08%. Whereas in South Africa, one of the biggest uh, institutions, we own 8, 10, 15% of companies. So Stanley always pops up in these uh, share registers. Stanley is a major shareholder. But in the offshore space, we appear under this other section because we don't feature at all. So that's how liquid actually these markets are. So that's one thing to consider versus physical property, uh, you've got liquidity and they're coming in cheaper at about 5%. If you invest in the UK, discounts the NAV about uh, 20% to as much as 30% below actually asset values. Versus bond yields, property is actually looking uh, very actually cheap in the offshore markets. So what do we do here, we, we say uh, property yields, less bond yields to get the yield gap. How much more am I getting versus a 10 year bond yield? So the long-term average has been about 155 basis points across the world. But the current, actually, uh, yield gap, you're getting 300 basis points above uh, the developed market bond yield. So which means property is fairly, actually, cheap. More so given that you've got earnings growth of about 5.7 to 6% on average uh, in hard uh, currencies. So that's from a yield gap perspective. From a yield ratio perspective, even more attractive. Because remember, when bond yields are almost 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, your yield gap, if bond yields are 10% and 0% or 0 0.1, is different. So likely from a ratio basis. So from a ratio basis, even much, much actually are cheaper at these levels. So which means actually bond yields can go up, but property's got a buffer. That's the buffer that you have in the property space, as long as you've got earnings growth. And bond deals go up because interest rates go up because there's inflation. If there's inflation, you get a rental growth. Property benefits from that. So we'll come up with different scenarios in our modeling uh, across uh, the world to sum up all these companies. Our one-year outlook in terms of earnings growth is about 5.7% uh, in dollars. And then over four years, about 5.6% earnings growth globally. That's a good number. In an environment where there's no inflation, because you're getting rental growth, there's limited supply, as I mentioned, and lower interest rates as well. So companies are able to refinance at lower interest rates. And then from a total return basis, uh, assuming the US 10 bond yield goes to 2.5%, which you don't think is likely at this stage, then flat returns. And then if it stays more like at these levels, up to 11% total returns in dollars. So everything is in dollars, yeah. And then over four years, we're saying lower for longer interest rates. Rates won't go back to the same levels as they were over the last uh, couple of years. So say US 10 years stays about 2.5% over four years, and then property can still achieve 7 to 8% total returns in dollars over the time, driven mainly by uh, income growth of about 6%. And the big question is, what happens when interest rates go up? We've done this exercise with the help of UBS that you've seen that actually property tends to go up when rates go up. The market corrects before, uh, probably a rate hike, we've seen that correction here, another correction here, and a correction here. So the market corrects before, so it prices that in before. 
So when it happens, it's not a surprise. So like when the rates go up in the US in December, people know about that. So you find the market is actually coming back now. So that creates buying opportunities. As long as rates go up because the economy is doing well, because there's demand. And so you see that as well. This is, these gray bars show the rate hiking cycles. So rates went up over this period, but property actually showed up, went up 100%, almost 100% over that period, when interest rates were going up. So why was that? Because the economy was doing uh, well. So that's one thing to actually think of as well, that uh, when rates start going up, it's already too late for you to be selling. It actually creates actually buying opportunities. But people tend to run away from property because rates are going up. And over different time periods, adding listed property in a global balance portfolio has helped to boost uh, returns. So again, just to refresh you on that, initial portfolio is 60% equities, 30% bonds, and 10% cash, and no, so no property at all. So if you didn't have property at all over 15 years, uh, but 5.9% returns. If you add up to 15% property, 6.7% annualized total returns. And that applies across all periods, basically, including the subprime crisis, where property fell as much as 70% and recovered. We've done this exercise actually for the Africa Property Fund, for emerging markets property, for our local property and developed markets property. And adding property in general has helped to boost our returns in balanced uh, portfolios. So don't forget property when you're doing asset allocation, but take a long-term view and focus on income, which is this slide here as well. That year in, year out, property companies, as you saw earlier on with the local companies, the critical element is the income, which is uh, these bars here. Capital does go down. We saw that in 2008, subprime crisis, but it still had income. So that was not justified, actually. Because that property shot up back as well. It gave you about 40% uh, total returns. And then it's been fairly positive since because the income has been fairly uh, consistent. So the simple thing we're looking at is compared property versus equity is that if you invest in an equity company, equity companies which are sitting in our global property fund is that you have to pay out, uh, you have to pay rent first before you pay out the dividend. So the property is more defensive because uh, if an equity investor will have got the rent uh, first. That's why the income element is uh, critical. One interesting development this is that uh, all along uh, in the world, property has always been uh, included as uh, part of financials index. So it means financials, you've got banks, you've got insurance companies. So property is part of financials index uh, in, in the US, S&P and MSCI index. So financials excluding real estate now is about 15%. Uh, so real estate now from end of August to September is now a standalone sector. So whereas before fund managers say, okay, I'm over with financials, but they're over it just banks and insurance companies and they ignore property. But now there's no way to hide because property is separate. When you disclose the performance numbers, you have to show how much property you have or you don't have. So that's changing the, the, the sector completely. To give an example, in the US uh, four weeks ago in an annual uh, conference by Merrill Lynch, um, the attendance was up 40%, 4 zero compared to the previous year. And you saw like flows going to the US funds, uh, weekly flows, they had a record flows of about $2.8 billion in mid-September, compared to the previous record of about $1.9 billion. So property is becoming a more popular asset class. So to conclude on offshore property, we see actually probably more upside than downside in the offshore property market space, as long as you've got positive growth and lower for longer interest rates. As some of those um, debt uh, expiries come through, they actually renewed at lower interest rates, helps to boost actually um, our returns. And the fact that there's still so much money chasing assets. Um, to give an example, UK before Brexit, there's about 32 billion pounds uh, chasing uh, London assets before Brexit uh, referendum. After Brexit referendum, the numbers from mid-September, the, the number shot up to 38 billion pounds looking for assets. So if you're looking for good assets in London, you can't find them. Actually, people actually have been disappointed. They're hoping to get bargains. You can't get bargains because 38 billion pounds chasing those assets. And you haven't seen the capital values fall as much. As long as it's not development, it's not residential. But good assets, retail offices, and right markets, they're doing well. And the big gap, as I mentioned, between property and bond yields and limited supply, that's a very critical thing. As these currencies turn around, uh, there won't be much space actually available, which is going to drive actually uh, rent. And the fact that property is now a standalone sector, that's going to create actually natural demand. The exercise done across the world is that uh, most funding managers, if not all across the world, have been underweight uh, property. And now we're seeing actually more interest coming through. Downside at this moment is actually more so Brexit more than anything else, but we believe some of that is actually priced uh, in. And rising interest rates and bond yields, but if that happens, most of the times actually are, are priced in, as long as they're getting actually positive uh, rental uh, growth. So that's the uh, global property story. We still like offshore property at these levels. We're not taking a currency view. It's difficult to take a currency view. We like it in terms of fundamentals. And 
you, you need diversification as well. Don't look at your statements every day. Don't look at share prices every day. It creates headaches. I don't look at them every day either because uh, we take a long-term view, three to five uh, year view. Especially this year, it's actually, you'll actually fall ill if you're going to check the prices every day. Yeah. So that's our story. Thank you for listening and we appreciate our attendance. Kilian, thank you very much.